Hi guys, welcome to Root Stem and welcome to this review and comparison of the new Gene Stealer Cult Codex. Hi guys, thank you very much for joining us. I don't think it's going to be a short video of this, so I'm going to be going through the brand new Gene Stealer Cult Codex. I'm going to be comparing it to the old codex, uh, unit-wise, maybe having a look at particular weapons that I personally like to use. So I'm not going to be looking at every little thing, um, but I'm going to be going through quite a lot of it. And uh, just basically just doing a comparison, seeing whether or not it's worth the money. Um, I'm going to start, of course, we've got a bit of a comparison with book size. This is the old Gene Steeler Cult Codex. This comes in at 120 pages, and this one is coming in at 112, I believe. Give me a second, I'm going to give away my cord at the back. Yeah, about 112 pages in total. Um, so there's a lot more in that, surprisingly, and you'll get to know why there's probably more in that. In a moment or two, when I actually get to the unit sizes. Now, get rid of the way for a sec. <clears throat> what I'm going to do, I'm going to skip a lot of the stuff. So we're going to go straight to the meat and potatoes of the book. We're going to be having a look at um, the rules that, of course, are coming out for these guys. So one of the first sections, of course, you come across uh, by the time I get to page 54. So about half. More than half, probably no. About more, about half a book is bump. Is your your painting, your painting, your, your your little pictures. Your um, it's got all of your uh, your details on how the cult operates and everything else. So all the story driven stuff at the front. Here is a list of uh, detachment abilities and all rules. Uh, you've got your Brew Brothers rules in here, which has already really been discussed by Games Workshop. Effectively, it's going to be a separate detachment. So if you're wanting to field Brew Brothers, you are going to have to spend command points to field separate detachments to be able to do so. Which is not good when you're wanting those command points for other things, uh, especially in the actual book itself. Also, if you spend more than 25% of your army's total, you're going to be a problem. I'll come back to that later because that... Um, I can see that being a bit of a pitfall uh, for a lot of current players, uh, if I'm honest, especially if you only collect up to, I mean, I don't collect to a particular limit. I just collect for collecting's sake and then play games with those models. Uh, and then of course I'll buy stuff if I need it, but it's going to be a problem. Now, standard detachment uh, abilities you've got, um, you know, you've got to have the whole, everyone in the, Detachment. So this is not actually saying that the people in the army have to have the same keyword, but people in the detachment have to have the same keyword for you to be able to get some of these abilities. Bearing in mind that the uh, units now have the Tyranid keyword, could it lead to some interesting combinations. But if your detachment um, is Gene Stealer Cult, then you can have a maximum of one of each Gene Stealer Cult character so no more fielding free column off so i don't think you could do that anyway um but you're literally limited to one patriarch one magus which is really annoying because actually i've got three lovely different patriarch models uh, from the through the years and i can only use one at a time unless i take again spend more command points on multiple detachments which it just really does limit the army a little um there is a quite an interesting role though, where if you have for each Gene Steel Cult model with a HQ detachment role, um, HQ role, so you can have one other um, Gene Steel Cult character model, maybe including this detachment without taking up a battlefield role slot. So you could have your Patriarch and your Magos, and then your Kalamorph and uh, some of the others could be effectively free. They wouldn't be actually taking up any particular slots. That's really good, that's really cool. Um, yeah, Patriarch's models now have to be uh, your Warlord. If it doesn't include any Patriarchs, um, your Primus and Magos then must be the Warlord. And then Chain Steel the Cult characters in that do not have an HQ Battlefield role cannot have a Warlord trait. I'm not quite sure how that does with some of the stratagems, but is how it is. 
Now, old GC recruit un cult units with cult creed. Uh, old GC recruit units with visibility and all the models in them gain a cult creed provided every unit in a detachment that belongs to a cult belongs to the same cult. That, to me, is reading. So all cult units in a detachment will gain a cult creed. All cult units. I believe Gene Steelers and the Patriarch have cult. So that could be quite interesting later on, especially if you've got some... Gene Steelers have got a little naughtier, but we'll come to that in a moment. This basically just goes on about how you, uh, you know, using your different cults, what they've got there, what warlord traits, etc., etc. Just how to build your army. Now, the cults in question have got all their own warlord traits, they've got all their own stratagems, and of course, they've got all their own psychic powers. I'm not going to be going through every single one of these. These, I think, they've been released a little bit. Uh, I know on my website, rootsdenver.co.uk, there is some images of leaks already on there. Um, so I'm just going to go through the creeds. So here, Cult of the Forearmed Emperor, you are able to reroll charge rolls for units. And if any attacks are made against a unit, and that is more than 12 inches away of your unit with this creed, is treated as one of the benefits of light cover. Um, so additional saves and being able to reroll uh, to hits. So like reroll charges, that's going to be a really good one, especially when we get to uh, what happens when you go to ambush later on. Here we've got disciplined militants for the Hive Cult. They're allowed to shoot in a turn and they fall back. But if they do so until the end of the turn, subtract one to hit, a bit like the old Ultramarines rule. But they can't charge and it's a cult unit. I would rather... <laughs> God. It's a cult unit. I would rather be able to actually have Gene Steeler cults have the ability to um, fall back and charge more than the uh, ability to fall back and shoot. But I suppose you're, if you're playing Hive Cult, you've really got to you know change your army and make sure it's a bit more, um, a bit more militaristic, a bit more standard units rather than the usual Gene Steelers and uh, yeah, hybrid units. Uh, you can also perform actions in, on the turn at which it fall back or advanced. That could be pretty good for a... Um, it, you also can shoot without the action failing. That's really good. That could be really powerful in certain situations, depending, of course, upon what missions, secondary missions you are taking in match play games. In non-match play games, probably a bit rubbish, but there we go. Raider Cog is, of course, the Mechanicus one. Um, all the models in that creed have a six up in Bumble save. Um, each time the unit is selected to shoot or fight, you can reroll really one wound roll when resolving the unit's attacks. That's always quite powerful, especially when you've got that one weapon that you always want to make sure is getting a good um, good hit. And you can add three inches to the range uh, of the character to the range characteristics of range weapons that models with this creed are equipped with excluding grenades and demolition charges. That could be really good with some of the pistols. Um, Kelomorph's pistol's 18 inch. If you're adding another three inches to that, uh, you're getting a good 21 inch. So you pretty much, you, all the Kelomorph needs to do is to move up the board and some people are on that deployment line. They're getting shot. Rusted Claw is uh, Nomadic Survivalists. Each time an attack is allocated to a model of this creed, as an armor penetration characteristic of minus one or minus two, the armor penetration characteristic of that attack is worsened by one. So effectively, you are ignoring minus ones and minus twos. You are ignoring one of those. Um, so anything that's minus one becomes a zero. Anything that's minus two becomes a one. That could be pretty powerful against Space Marines, especially their tactical, I'm saying tactical, it's mainly their intercessor teams, which have the ability, especially on turn two, um, with their tactical strategy to become minus two. Uh, negating that or softening it, it can be quite powerful. You'd be surprised how many times the, the percentages on your dice can completely change when that's actually happening. And each time this unit with a creed makes a move or, or an advanced move in your movement phase until the end of the shooting phase, it counts as having remained stationary. That's only good if you're taking a lot of heavy weapons in your teams, uh, meaning that you're not going to have the traditional minus one to hit, uh, which could be really good when you're combining it with some of the crossfire rules that we're going to come across later on. So the pauper princes. This is going to be ones for the people. These are for the people. These two really are for the uh, the ones that I wanted to make sure you can get in there and get stuck in. 
Um, the Devoted Zealots, um, they get a plus one to their hit rolls if they do the same thing as Space Marines. So if they charge, if they make a melee, if they, char if they make a charge, are charged, or do an heroic intervention, they add one to the attack's hit roll. Also, a, each time a combat attrition test is taken for a unit with his creed, you ignore any and all modifiers, meaning that they only will only ever run away on ones. Quite powerful, especially with the plus one to hit. Quite a lot of Gene Steel Coat units will be hitting on threes for your mainline guys. So hitting on twos make, can make a big difference. That could make a giant swing. And then, of course, the one I like to run, my favourite, Twisted Helix. Uh, I think a lot of people are going to be running these in future games, mainly due to add one to the strength characteristic of models with this creed. Very good. Add one to the move characteristics of models with this creed. That's replacing the, uh, might have a plus two to your advanced rolls. And then each time an attack is made against the unit with this creed, an unmodified wound roll of one or two always fails respective of any abilities that the weapon or, or the attacker may have. That is going to come in handy if you're coming across a lot of special weapons uh, or heavy weapons. Probably you're going to find that that's not really going to kick in a lot for your infantry, um, especially since a lot of your infantry are going to be toughness three or four. And you, if you're going against, I always compare everything to the Space Marines because they have a most prolific unit that you tend to, you know, prolific army that you tend to come across in 40k. So I always state that if you're going to come across a weapon, it's mainly going to be strength four and it's going to be a minus one on average. So that doesn't really kick in. That kicks in when you've got some really big, powerful las cannons across from your rock grinders, as an example. Uh, they need twos to wound. Uh, no, I wouldn't actually need twos to wound. It's something that's really, really powerful coming across uh, some of your tanks. Or, or if someone's got the ability to be able to plus one to wound, you're going to be able to negate that. That's going to stop certain units being absolutely annihilated by really heavy, powerful weapons. Uh, AKA some of the more modern stuff that seems to be coming for the Tau. Now, you do get the ability to make your own cult creed. But this is really weird. This is very different to what I've seen on a lot of other codexes. You get kind of, um, it's called like, it's like you've got points. You've got like myriad cult points, like four of them to be able to spend. So if you wanted to, you could take four of these. Um, or you can take two of them and two of them. So you can have a, a very a good mix of different creeds together. This one does make me laugh of a splinter cult. Basically, it costs you all four of your points, and it literally says that you, you just use one of the other creeds that's in the book. So, not quite sure why that's in there. Probably to try and make sure that in tournaments, if somebody says, hey, I'm um, Killer Creed 76, but I use Twisted Helix, then it's fine. You know, you've got a, you've got a reason to be able to do that. And some of these, and they're all right, but they're they're not really. They're kind of like little bits of the the standard cults that we've already come across. Accustomed to tall ones and twos always fail to wound. Ignore combat attrition. Um, that's quite a good one. This one where it's uh, each time a model of this creed makes an attack with an industrial weapon. So they've grouped a lot of weapons together and called them industrial weapons. Um, so they ignore any hit or modifiers to ballistic and weapon skill. That could be really good if you've got a lot of um, saws. Um, because they are actually, a lot of those weapons are kind of minus one to hit now. Which when you're only getting a couple of attacks can be a little, a little, a little infuriating if you can't actually get, you know, if you can't, you can't get those hits on there, especially when it's 50-50. Taking it back to the original cult creeds, which were effectively a single page um, in the the book. <laughs> um, don't get me wrong, we, everyone can actually benefit from a cult, pretty much a cult creed now, but at the time um, it was only two pages and that is quite a lot of pages dedicated to different cults. Um, there is, you know, a hive cult militants, you, you, you don't really have that many people flee. A lot of these are old rules, like proper old rules, that you really did need to get rid of, especially some of the, the morale stuff. Um, so it's a very good blessing. It's a very nice change to see them actually update something. 
and make it better for once. Now we're going to go into some stratagems. I was actually looking to see how many pages of stratagems we got in this book. Um, I think the stratagems are a bit more widely spread out as well. Oh no, oh no, I've got four and five, probably a bit more actually. We've got more strats. We've got three pages, I think there's four pages of stratagems here. Yes. Uh, some of them are nice, some of them are terrible. Um, some of them are really, really clever, especially when you uh, use them together with other stratagems. For example, rapid advance. Um, some of these look like they belong in an Elder Codex, by the way, where you can, a Gene Stealer cult, uh, when a Gene Stealer cults Gene Stealer, biker or vehicle unit from your army advances, do not make an advance roll. Instead, unit advances six inch. Now, bearing in mind that Gene, uh, gene Stealers have not lost the ability to be able to advance and charge, and they've got a base movement of eight, which means that you can spend that and they're getting up there and they're gonna be able to charge, meaning that you can pretty much get a nice uh, nice unit of gene steals right up into your enemies more. Um, you've also got one that feels like it's straight out of the Imperial Guard Codex with a plus one to any armor save made for that attack, but as long as you're receiving the benefit of cover, so you can plus in two, because you are one with the shadows. There's quite a few that start talking about your uh, target having crossfire and um, exposed, which I'll be honest with you is more one for later on. Uh, so, but you just you will get quite a few of those stratagems talking about how they um, can, you know, oh, that one allows you to do Colts Crossfire and you get a special ability for it. This one is if it's, ex no, but they must be exposed and you get some special abilities for it. There is quite a few of those running through here. So it is going to be one of those where you're kind of like hitting hit and running. You're looking at whether or not you can crossfire a unit. You're looking at whether or not you can come up to a unit properly and like, oh, all yeah, right, am I going to be able to get across there? Am I going to have, you might even find that you're actually taking units just to sort of stick right at the back of the enemies. There's nothing there. They're just going to get shot at, but they're there so that you can create crossfire and exposed, which is always, a, it's a good thing, but it could be a, could be a bad thing because it does mean that you're kind of wasting elements of your army just to get shot up. Uh, that is one of my favourites though, this Overload Fuel uh, Cells. This is for Gene Sealer Cult units in the shoot or fight phase. And if it's it's going to overload with an industrial weapon, so we'll come to those again. Um, uh, if it does so, then the unit making a shoot and a fight attack each time the model makes an attack, it can either, it's a ranged weapon, Add one to the damage characteristics of that of that attack. Pretty good, if I'm honest. Um, so, I mean, especially when you're trying to take out some tanks, or you're coming across that dreaded minus one to damage, which a hell of a lot of units have got nowadays. You can try and negate it. If it's a melee weapon, you add one to the strength characteristic of the attack. Uh, although the downside here is, is that um, if any unmodified hit rolls of one are made for attacks with that weapon. After the attacker's model's unit has finished making its attacks, it suffers one mortal wound. I believe, um, from what I can read on that, it just says that the unit is taking a mortal wound, so you're not removing the industrial weapon. I find it quite interesting that you're kind of murderizing your own guys to be able to remove, <laughs> be able to keep these weapons running. You've got stuff like Devoted Crew, that's kind of uh, what you saw in the, uh, pre uh, if you ever got the expansion, not the expansion, um, the Psychic, oh, I forgot what I call that Psychic one. Anyway, I'll have to try and put it up there. It's the one where, um, you know, where the, the kind of mini books came out with lots and lots of different elements for different armies in there, and it allowed you to have the additional units, additional stratagems. I think Devoted Crew was in there. Uh, Rig to Blow is a nice one where you can come up and just explode. I always like stuff like that. Um, Legendary Demise is really good for your Kelomorph. I can see, I've got one. I've not built him or painted him up yet, but I've got one. I can see him being a model that's gonna get shown and played with quite a lot. Um, after it's finished unit attacks, uh, when you remove, when you get destroyed, shoot as if it were a shooting phase and resolve these attacks to destroy a killer morph model is then removed. That's really cool because it kind of like, it's as if he's been taken, he's taking people out as he's been taken out himself. 
water. Um, Gaysalt consciousness is quite a you. It's a very strange one because if you manifest a lessened psychic power by instructs you to select a friendly unit. When selecting the unit, you don't have to be within range. You can be anywhere on the battlefield. So any blessing powers, if you ever look for some good ones, you can be at the opposite end of the battlefield and give that to a unit. That's pretty good when you've actually got units popping up. So if you've got a unit popping up behind some enemy units and you're thinking. I want to cast that blessing on that unit. You haven't got to have your Magus or your Primarch, uh, so Patriarch, sorry, um, appear next to them for them to be able to gain the benefit. They can be anywhere on the board. Like that, that's probably going to get quite, it's going to get quite a lot of use. Um, Reckless Demolitions is quite a good one because some of the grenades have changed for Genie Steel of Cult because they actually a lot better than you do you get from your normal um, Imperial Guard where you can literally throw a grenade into um in the fight phase um rather than <laughs> rather than actually just sort of like doing some form of fight it's like you can chuck a grenade but it's reckless so you can actually cause mortal wounds against your own units which is hilarious in my opinion quite very much as well um very much so that's what you would do and um, you'd see people chucking grenades and especially when they're being controlled by something alien and that's kind of just sacrificing their lives to be able to get its own way you've got um, I, I, leaders of a cult that's pretty similar to a strategy now I think it was 2 CP before where you added and you can give a Magus and a, uh, a, a Primar not pa a Primus Magus and a Primus and a Patriot all had Warlord traits that's pretty much that if you've got a cult um, if your Warlord is the Patriarch when up to two other HQ models can have Warlord traits now bearing in mind that there's only three HQ models in here which is the Patriarch the Magus and the Primus so if you're going to have all three, you are, you're you probably going to take that and you're probably going to give them all a Warlord trait. Why wouldn't you? Uh, Grand Size Gifts is just giving people uh, additional um, relics. I always call it a relic. Um, some of these as well now, I'm, I'm going to kind of skip through if I possibly can. Um, You've got Genetic Lineage, which is quite nice because that's the hybrid one from the Psychic Awakening. Here we go. Psychic Awakening book. Um, that allows you to uh, just basically mean that the, uh, your hybrids can advance and still charge in the turn. And we can also now, um, until the end of that turn, as soon as I charge in the turn in which it advanced. I thought there was one where you could fall back and advance and still do it, but uh, that might be a psychic power actually. That, I like that. Um, I did bring, try to keep using that from the um, book uh, when I could. Uh, the Psychic Awakening book because I thought it was quite a nice power to have. And you've got lots of like tunnel crawlers, uh, which allows people to affect area terrain. Return to the Shadows and Lurk in the Shadows are a little bit different. Turn to the Shadows is actually it's, it's pretty much the same thing, but it just basically states that you don't go into reserve, you just pop up nine inches away. Um, these lurk in the shadows for units from your army, so on moral shoots. Um, if that unit is not the closest eligible target or within 12 inches of the enemy model, then the unit should, and then until the unit's that model cannot be targeted. That's a lot better. I mean, it's 2 CP, but it's a lot better than what it used to be. It used to be really. Bit more overly complicated that, or if it was the closest and it could do, and yeah, yeah, yeah. This is if you're not within 12 inches, you can't be shot. So, if you've got a unit at the back that you do not want to be shot, you can just play Lurk in the Shadows and they can't shoot you. I find that quite fascinating, I find that quite good. Uh, this one's quite nice Primed Explosive 1 CP, where you can literally chuck a grenade. And it counts as an automatic um, six shots rather than it, or you know, the maximum amount of shots it needed rather than rolling for it. I would have liked to have seen the strategy mats in the for the Crimson slash Imperial Fists and Imperial Guard, where like up to ten guys can throw grenades. But grenades and these guys have got better, so that's probably why you've not seen that strategy. We've also now got proficient. Yeah, that one. Planning, mm, yes. Um, this is kind of like what you had with the characters from the Space Marines where you could give them the ability to be able to upgrade uh, a chaplain or the ability to be able to upgrade a captain to a chapter master. This is the Gene Sealer Cult equivalent. Now, 
couple of that I do like. Uh, lying in wait is the old school sort of ambush stratagem where you can turn up more than three inches away. You probably end up with a unit doing that. Um, especially if you're playing on, I tend to play on a six foot by four foot table, so deep striking is not too much of an issue. But if you are playing on one of the modern boards, which to me is more of a five foot less than four foot, um, you're not going to have you're not going to have a lot of room. So you're probably going to find yourself using that with a particular unit. You might even want to use it with a very large unit, just so that it becomes a bullet sponge. Um, a bit like right, right, the unit's going to sacrifice itself. Because people need to deal with it and if they don't deal with it then it's going to mess things up that's also really good if you want to nab that objective from somebody they're about to score a good 10 points for having two objectives it's like oh well my turn i'll just drop this unit down here it doesn't really matter if it doesn't do anything it stops you gaining an additional five points um trap sprung is one i can see being used quite a lot it's where you can roll an additional dice uh for your charge so you roll three discard one these, by the way, can only be added to one unit once in your whole entire army, I believe. I don't think it's per detachment. It's like one, and it's power rate and increase. Uh, so yeah, I believe that you can only actually take one of these per army. If it's per detachment, I will... In fact, you know what? Yeah, I was correct. I thought I did read it right. It is per army. Um... So it's not something that you can keep sort of like, oh, I'll just take two or three detachments so I can have three people with traps sprung. You're going to have to be really tactical on how you're using them, which is pretty cool because I don't mind doing don't mind doing quite a lot of tactics with Gene Steeler Cults, but it does mean that you're going to have to really think ahead on what you're going to do. And the problem I find with planning is that the best laid plans are great until they make contact with the enemy. I mean, it always chucks it into uh, a tailspin. These are all right. These are good. They're not a lot of points. Maximum amount is 20. The lowest is 10. Um, and they pretty much all of them are one power. So if you are playing a power rating game, it's going to cost you nothing to be able to add these to pretty much any particular unit. It does state that it is just for a Gene Steeler Cult unit. It doesn't exclude it to certain core unless it specifically states now next up we've got some warlord traits i've got my old book out yay so we can actually have a bit of a comparison uh one is still the same still called for focus of adoration it's actually in the old codex it was infantry and biker units could perform a heroic intervention while within six inch effectively of the warlord uh, now it's core and cult pure strain gene stealers uh, within six inch of your warlord that is actually a big difference because i think adherents are not a core unit um, so if you are uh, looking at taking adherent units, then they probably not going to come in and help with all of that might be one that you don't bother with. Uh, Shadow Stalker is subtract ones um, for hit rolls for attacks that target your uh, Warlord. That is still the same. Biomorph Adaptation, add one to the attacks. And this is one to the attack and strength characteristic in the old codex. And the new codex will swap that around to attacks toughness now that could swing some dice rolls especially if you've been hit by particular weapons um i know at the moment the toughness of the um patriarch is now fine so it has gone down but sticking it on there you're going to be able to boost it back up to the original six we've got new one so this is the only one that's new it's prowling adjutant and once per turn, when the Warlord is selected to target the charge, before the charge roll is made, and after firing any Overwatch, it can make a normal move. Inch, so you could effectively fall back with that unit. That's pretty cool if something's only just within charge range, and you think, well, I'm just going to fall back with that one. I can see a lot of Magus units probably using that, just to try and make sure that they're not within a charge range. You know, if you're taking up to three Warlord traits, that's Probably one of those that you're going to give to your Magus. Then, of course, you've got um, Alien Magistry. Majesty. Add three into the range of Warlords. Aura abilities, that is still pretty much the same. Um, but it also states add three into the range of the Fallen abilities this Warlord has. If any Jackal, particular Panning, priority target. So that is kind of being a bit more specific, but it is, it is effectively the same. Uh, three. 
preternatural, oh I can't say half of these words, preternatural speed, mm, that one. Number six is each time your warlord makes a melee attack, you can reroll to hit. Now that's completely different to what it used to be in this one. In this one it always fights first, if the enemy units have charged even at a similar ability, uh, you can select this unit uh, warlord trait for a locus. But you gotta remember that I don't think Locust is gonna be able to have Warlord traits anymore, so it doesn't really have to include that in there. Um, each time a Warlord makes a melee attack, reroll to hit, and at the start of the fight phase, if this Warlord is engaged in range with enemy units, it can fight first. Not massive improvements overall, but still enough to give you some good options. I think uh, the attack and toughness will probably get used quite a lot. I can also see maybe Shadow Stalker will probably get used quite a bit. Speed. Now you can reroll to hit. Well, uh, the Brood Mind Discipline again. I've got my old school book out. Let's have a look at. <laughs> Wrong way. Let's have a look at some of these psychic powers. Now, I remember which way it is for the psychic powers. Of Michael Creed. Mm. There we go. Okay, going past the page. Uh, so, first one, one and one, mass hypnosis, same. Uh, walk charger seven, same. Select one enemy unit with an 18, same. And uh, now you subtract one from the attack characteristics of the models. Subtract one to hit rolls. And in the fight phase, the unit is not eligible to fight at all. Eligible units from your army have done so. That could be really good to try and stop a unit from being able to fight back effectively. Um, pretty good against something like First Bond Space Marines, or maybe even some of the new uh, Aspect Warriors. If you've ever seen any of those leaks, it does look like they're going to be getting two attacks apiece. Mind Control uh, used to be roll 3d6 and you could make an attack. Now, Mind Control is. Each time it makes an attack, subtract one from the attack's hit roll. If the result of the psychic test was equal to or greater than the leadership, subtract one from the unit's leadership characteristics and one from combat attrition tactics. Pretty good against guard, probably. Psionic Blast. I think this one has actually changed. No, is it? Yeah, it has changed. Um, it used to be 18-inch uh, and visible. I have a look out, so as if it's like a color. 18-inch. Um, if you roll, you basically used to cause D3 more, it used to cause one mortal wound and if you got the same as the leadership characteristic, it suffered D3 mortal wounds. Now it suffers D3 mortal wounds and if you get the leadership characteristic, it suffers three mortal wounds straight off. Bit of an improvement there. Mental onslaught, now this has really changed. So what you used to do is, uh, you used to pick an enemy unit, manifestation of six, it's now a manifestation of five, so it's got better, and it's 24 inches, whereas it used to be, um, it used to be 18. This is definitely going up in the world, this particular bar. You, each player then rolls a d6 and has a model's leadership characteristic. If your score is higher, the unit suffers one more wound. If your selected model is still alive, and you repeat the process until either the selected model is destroyed or you fail to inflict one mortal wound. And you see, that's just model. So that was pretty good for destroying enemy units. This is changed completely. So you roll, you pick a unit that's visible within 24 inches, and you roll 46. For each result of a five up, the unit suffers one mortal wound. If any models in that unit are destroyed um, as a result of those mortal wounds, but the unit is not destroyed, keep repeating this process, reducing the number of dice rolled by one each time until one of the following conditions are met. The number of dice to roll is zero. You re -roll, you roll no results of five plus on no enemy units are destroyed. That I can see being a pretty much a, a guaranteed in quite a few different armies, especially if your Magos is going to be sat at the back um, doing some long range fire support. Now we've got a couple more blessings here. So these are the ones that you're going to be able to spend the command points on to try and put them onto other units. Um, the Psychic Stimulus. Now, Psychic Stimulus used to be unit within 18. Um, um, it could advance even if it charged. So if it advanced, it could still charge and it always fought first. 
now it is the unit is able to shoot and or declare a charge in return to which it advanced or fell back so you can fall back and still charge Models in this unit do not suffer the penalty incurred to their hit roll for firing assault weapons in the same term in which they in which their unit advance. That could be pretty good if you've got quite a few flamers in some units or maybe some shotguns. Yeah, that could be really good actually. Um, if you're trying to run right up the field. Might from beyond is pretty much I think the same. Yeah, it's uh walk charge. Oh it's gone down, it's walk charge of six now instead of seven. 18 inch and even it gets Ah. The relics I'm kind of going to quickly go through, not in too much detail. Um, Amulet of the Void Worm has changed. Um, you now get a 4 up in vulnerable save instead of adding 1 to your saving throws. Um, once per battle, it can channel the shadow. If it does, it automatically gets a 6. Do not roll uh, for saving throw. You can just do it once for the game saying, no, I definitely want that to be a 6. Each time a bear declares a charge, enemy units that were targeted by that charge cannot fire overwatch or set to defend. That's pretty good because you're actually stopping two abilities there. Uh, there's no icon of a cult ascendant, but that's simply because the uh, the way the icons worked have completely changed. Uh, Gift from Beyond has really ramped up. Uh, each time you select a unit, um, each time you select a target for this weapon, you can ignore the lookout sir rule. And of course, uh, if the attack is made with this weapon, unmodified wound roll of four up, and put one mortal wound of a target, and there's any damage. It's also, as you can see there, heavy one, strength five, minus three, and three damage at 48 inches. That's pretty cool. Um, I do find it a bit strange that you've got a really cool sniper rifle um, on a lot of the jackals, but it doesn't actually state it has to be just on jackals now. It just says anyone with equipped with a cult sniper rifle, but hopefully your little. Uh, they're called Aphantus. I think it's those guys. And uh, with sniper rifles, they're going to be able to uh, move forward and be able to actually take out some units. Unwilling Orb is a good one. This is a new one uh, that they've actually added, and it's the bear can attempt to deny one additional psychic power to your opponent in your opponent's psychic phase. While the bear is on the battlefield, each time an attempt to deny psychic power to do so from any range of 7 to 24 inches, so it's a good like, couple of powers regardless of where he is on the battlefield. Each time the bear attempts to manifest a malediction or witch fire power, add one to the psych, uh, to the attempts, uh, to the attempt psychic. So you're basically adding one if you want it to be quite aggressive with it. I like that, it's nice. I like you said the unwilling orb because of course it's uh, somebody else taking control of him but I like the flavour that it's got there. So I'll skip past the crude saved section because we'll probably do, I'll probably do a separate video with that one for people that are interested so keep an eye out for that one. Um, the, this just talks about the ambush markers. Ambush is kind of changed mainly to just infantry and biker units. You still set up ambush the same as you did before putting markers down instead of making sure that those markers are all within the deployment zone and making sure that the enemy is not within six inches. I've also detailed a little bit better on which can do that. Only units with the ability called conceal can actually hide. Um, they also get what's called underground, which is a new with, I, I mean, I still call it deep striking because of the old games, but this is kind of a new way of deep striking. The Rather than it being nine inches away from an enemy unit, you are now, when you come on from reserve, so you set them up in reinforcements, and then when you set them up, you can do so under these conditions. You can set the unit anywhere up, anywhere on the battlefield, and it's more than eight inches away from enemy models, or six inches away from enemy models, but cannot charge. So you are getting very close uh, with those type of things. You're actually getting really right up in people's faces. Now, a lot of people I have seen online complaining because this rule did come out, saying that, uh, ah, well, it's only an extra inch. Um, where's this, where's that? You've got to remember percentage-wise, I think it's about 27%, roughly or less, uh, to roll a nine plus on 2d6, and it's about 42 to 45% to roll an 8 plus on 2d6. So you are starting to get more towards a 50-50 chance of getting off those charges. 
especially when you start mixing it by adding an additional dice and you may not select two you're probably going to be coming away with a charge on the first turn for quite a lot of your units in there if you're wanting them to some of your other units you're not going to want them to um, get those charges off you're just going to want them to sit at the back and uh, give somebody some toasting give somebody some shotgun and be able to do some of the new crossfire rules revealing your markers remains the same and your unquestionable loyalty is also the same please know that uh, yeah this is pretty much any any cult model or brood brothers unit within three inches um, can absorb wounds on a four up if uh, if they fail a save basically this is what it says it's a, if you um, each time a saving throw made for a cult model from your army has failed you can select one friendly cult or brood brother model with this ability within three inch you do have to pick models um, and it can take an uncrushable log test to do so roll a d6 adding one to results the character to the patriarch on a four up or three up to patriarch this is passed that model selected is destroyed so you've got to be careful you can't just have a unit within three you're gonna have to have like a whole squad and there's one or two guys and then taking off from the back end you're gonna have to have a full squad in there um they have provided us with counters of games workshop right i mean these are the old counters that they provide them still got nice to run back in quite easy to do so and here we've got counters ready for this particular game. I love the fact that they look like old school blips, very reminiscent of my time playing Space Hulk. And at the opposite side, they double up as crossfire counters, as you can see down here. Now, crossfire is a new rule for our Gene Stealer Colts. What basically it means is, is that every unit that has a Gene Stealer Cult keyword excluding and aligned and um, percentage ratio of Blues Brothers units every unit um, from your army that belongs to a cult belongs to the same cult this unit as the ability what happens with crossfire is in your shooting phase um, each time a crossfire unit is selected to shoot if all those attacks target one enemy unit with without a crossfire marker after resolving those attacks target gains a crossfire marker if any of the following conditions were satisfied Five or more models were hit, so if you hit more than five times, you've got it. One or more of those attacks was a damage characteristic other than one scored a hit. So if you've got a big weapon, damage two, damage three, and it scores a hit, it doesn't matter if the others have scored a hit, you are getting some crossfire. So, at the end of a turn, you do remove all crossfire counters, but the effects of crossfire are as such. Each time a crossfire model has a it makes a each time a crossfire model makes a range attack, if a unit has a crossfire marker, so there is units that can use this and units that can't use this, you add one to the attack's hit roll. Each time a crossfire model makes a range attack, if a target unit has a crossfire marker and was exposed, which is quite good, um, when it was selected as a target, add one to the attack's wound roll. Each time a crossfire model makes a range attack, if the target unit has a crossfire marker, was exposed, and was a selected car target and within 12 inches of the selected target, it does not receive the benefits of cover. Now that doesn't state the plus ones or minus ones, it just says you just ignore cover if you're within 12 inches and somebody's got one of those markers. I can see people doing a lot of support in fire. You are gonna have to sort of, hopefully there's not gonna be a massive cost in point you know massive difference in points cost but i can see people doing a huge difference in crossover fire uh, coming and you're gonna have to really start looking at what units you can take you're probably gonna end up with some units that have got bigger weapons maybe opening fire so right you just can score a hit to get crossfire on a unit and then some smaller units will be opening up to try and uh, take them out um it's nice don't get me wrong it's great, but it, it, it pluses one to hit. So it's kind of getting rid of that idea of the fact that Gene Sealer Cult is very much like Guard, where it can't hit. You, As long as you focus fire on something, you are going to be able to get those hit. Now, to expose something, this is where I can see a lot of arguments happening. You've got to draw a line from any part of the base or hull of one model in the attacking crossfire unit to any part of the base or hull of one model in another friendly crossfire unit that is visible to that model, as shown in the diagram. The target unit is exposed if both the following conditions are satisfied. 
Now, this does state crossfire. So it's got to be a crossfire unit that you are shooting at or through, as it were. So you've got that unit's got to be in the middle. This gives a really bad example because it shows a very obvious crossfire and it shows a very obvious not crossfire. What we really wanted is an example of that 50-50 of when it's, is it crossfire? If, for me, you should really just turn your tape measure sideways, draw it along a line of two models and of course if part of that goes across somebody's base or hole then it is in crossfire. That's how I would work it out. It's, it's always easier to do so. Um, you can't, of course, do for obscuring terrain. Because obscuring terrain can't, you can't fire through it. So you're gonna to have to make sure that if it's a ruins there and someone's sat in some ruins, you are behind them in those ruins. You are not just sat at the opposite end of those ruins because you are not gonna get a crossfire. The only exception to the obscuring terrain rule is if it's something like an aircraft or super heavy that can be targeted through those pieces of terrain regardless. We've also got some of the cult. Now this, to me, is... A friend of mine actually said this. Games Workshop seems to be thinking of ways to minimise the model count on the tabletop now they've changed the game board size. So now they've changed the board size to a smaller board, they've got to think of a way for you to be able to have good games with smaller, slightly smaller armies. And we've started seeing this where, especially if you play like a thousand point space screens, you don't really get a lot. Um, I've started noticing it with like, for example, orc units seem to be a bit more pricey, but they've got a bit higher toughness. We're probably gonna see it with the elder ones getting a hell of a lot of invulnerable saves. And we're seeing it with this, where you can get a, what's called summon the cult. So each time a near front hybrid unit from your army summons the cult, D6 destroyer models can be added back to the unit. Uh, each time any other gene steel unit from your army summons a cult, the three destroyer models can be added back to that unit with their full remaining. If a unit could be summoned to a cult more than once, e.g. a unit equipped with a cult icon is also in range of a icon mod. Okay, you go look at that changing stuff. Uh, the results are cumulative, however, no more than six can be added back to neophyte hybrids and no more than three can be added back to other gene steel cult units per turn. These return models can only be within engagement range, uh, can only be set up with engagement range that are all in the engagement of a unit being added back to. So if you are in combat, you can actually add models back into combat, which is pretty nice. But it's summoning the cult and I believe you do that in your command phase. Um, so you basically just start adding models back, which could be really cool, but it does mean you need to have icons. And if I, <laughs> if I am being serious, I got rid of all my icons. I didn't really like the icons in the original. So I'm going to have to try and find a bunch of icons or proxies for icons for my uh, gene stealer units and probably start sticking them. Now, I know this is a long video, so I do apologize, but here is the meat and potatoes of the actual video we are going to be looking at different units and comparing them to their previous incarnations and or counterparts i'm not looking at points value because that's at the back and the old codex didn't have points values for it we're going to be looking at power rate and we're going to be looking at what the units can do bearing in mind that patriarchs for example have got cults so these things are going to be able to benefit from your cult creed now which is what we've always wanted anyway so the Patriarch, we are looking at a very similar start line. It's got a better ballistic skill for some reason, um, but it's got one less strength. So it's back down to a strength of six. I mentioned toughness earlier. That's my fault, I do apologize. It has got an increased wound, which makes it uh, seven wounds compared to the original six. And it's now got a four up in vulnerable save. You've still got your swift deadly. You've still got your living idol. So, but it's for combat attrition tests, so you can still lose models from a failed morale. It can now cast two friendly psychic powers. And if you decide to take a familiar, familiars are not a separate unit anymore. They are just little models that you stick next to your big guys. Very much like the cherubs from Sisters of Battle, uh, AKA Adeptus Thoratus. Uh, you can re-roll psychic test taken for the model if you've got a familiar, you just remove it afterwards. 
Not quite sure why a lot of people would actually do that, now, if I'm honest. The Patriots claws have changed a little bit. You're no longer rolling for damage. It's just a straightforward D3. The wounding on a six still causes it to be a minus six and straight characteristic of three. I don't like a lot of damage too. I've done a, a bit of a rant about this previously, how a hell of a lot of units now seem to have minus one damage. Damage two has become a little bit redundant. Um, it doesn't really serve much of a purpose anymore because quite a lot of vehicles, quite a lot of dreadnoughts as an example, they just go, yeah, yeah, we're minusing one. Apparently a lot of the new Wraith Guard units uh, coming out for the Eldar, they're gonna have minus one damage. So it becomes a bit of a, well, what is the point? That's like overcharging plasma. There's no real point in having damage two. So I'd much rather have a random damage of D3, meaning I can still do some damage if need be. The Primus, he has, uh, he's gone up to toughness four. Still remaining pretty much the same elsewhere. He's got a ballistic skill of two plus now. But his uh, sculpt needle pistol has uh, got a greater range. Still got sort of like the same profile to it. Uh, your bone sword has now changed again, going up to two damage. Not quite sure why. I don't really need it. Our toxin injector is wounding on four. Oh, but there's now no uh, no six to make it a minus four, which is a bit of a shame, really. He's also lost his grenades. Um, you can still reroll core units, because of course everything's core nowadays. So reroll hit rolls of one for core units within six inch of a Primus. Um, but he can now, with his meticulous planning in the command phase, this is every time, so this has got a lot better. So like one friendly core unit within nine, and that unit can reroll wound rolls of one. That's nice, that's a lot different. You'll probably find people will start to take Primuses now and stick them in the back line uh, just to make sure that they're re-rolling those hit and wound rolls. You've got a Magus. Of course, you've got a Magus before. No real change on the stat line. Pretty much the same thing. You do have some nice bio daggers, which just used to be a cultist knife. That's got the ability to wound in a free open and inflict some mortal wound rather than it being any form of attack. The force stave is a bit better, it's got an increase in strength, but your old pistol remains the same. You can also have a psychic familiar. Spiritual leader, well within six, if you would take a mortal wound, you can ignore it in six. That's very different from the um, one where your units could then deny as if they were a psyker. I much preferred it when they could deny as a psyker, especially when you were versing things like Powers and Sons. Um, but again, you can manifest two psychic powers and deny one. It knows smite and two psychic powers from the blue mind discipline. That that's makes Magus is for me a hell of a lot better um, because you can cast two. That's the main thing is casting two. It's same with this big lad. Being able to cast two can be a game changer. But they've always been able to take three. So okay, now next HQ we've got the acolyte icon ward. Um, so that's always a good one. I mean, you can always stick a, uh, a bit of a warlord trait with that one. These guys have gone up to toughness four, which a lot of the hybrids have, or the big hybrids with the three arms at least have done. Of course, you've got the concealing and questionable loyalty. Um, Nexus of Devotion. Now, it used to be a unit within six infantry or biker, other than an adherent, um, loses a wound whilst within six. Um, it, you know, on a six up, it ignores um, those particular wounds. Bishul Vigor meant that you uh, rerolled ones when they were doing uh, ignore wounds on a five up for um, adherent units. And you can reroll um, morale tests for units within six. Now, what's actually happening now is it's got Nexus of Devotion. So, in your command phase, if a friendly cult core units within six inch of its model, that unit can summon a cult. So, it basically starts. In models back to its spell. Um, the banner can also perform an action, which is very strange because, um, of course, this is the first time I've ever seen really an action done on a unit. At the end of the, of the move, unit steps of your movement phase, one icon, uh, icon ward can perform this action. The action is complete at the end of your charge phase. If it's successful, the model performing the action gains the following aura ability. Basically, um, well, a friendly cult infantry or biker unit is our uh, character is within excluding gene stealer 
within six inch add one to the charge rolls made for you that's pretty good so if you uh you manage to get somebody in there uh, there is a rule i believe in meticulous planning to over its free command phase uh, for meticulous planner I think it says that if you've got something that you do, not for the materials planning, but anything, any actions that you do in your command phase, you can actually do it when you come in from reinforcements. So next to Devotion, if you want to stick an icon ward in reserve, on seal, something takes a bit of a chilling up, you could just pop in right in that middle and just be like, yeah, right, okay, uh, uh, that one, oh, you can you can get some models back. That's always going to be, I think that'll be what I'll probably be using it for. Turn three, pop up and add some units. Uh, Jackalanthus, the ab abominant, has disappeared from the HQ choices, unfortunately. Jackalanthus has uh, come down in wounds, no longer has five wounds. And the, it's now a Colt sniper rifle than a Jackal sniper rifle. It's gone up in power, it's now strength five minus three, whereas it used to be strength four minus two. Again, two damage and a four up from mortal wound. It's not the greatest. But here we get a first, oh, actually you did there as well. You get a look at blasting charges. So blasting charges are no longer a frag grenade, their own entity. So you've got a grenade of, it's a D3, it's strength five, minus one, and one damage. That is a lot better. Um, not the greatest, but it does mean that if you're going against guardsmen, you're gonna be wounding them on freeze. In fact, you're gonna be wounding space marines on freeze. It's just that you're only gonna get up to three shots with it rather than five. Now, some hybrids. These are the, uh, these are the Acolyte hybrids. And the squad sizes remain pretty much the same. Um, oh no, no, actually it's come down. It used to be able to have between five and 20, it is now between five and 15, which is, uh, it's not, it's, it's all right, I'll be honest with you. I never run it as a squad of 20 anyway. I tend to run them as squads of 10, um, mainly because I find five just dies too easy. You are getting, of course, an increase in toughness. So you are now gonna to be toughness four. It's going to be a lot harder for units to be able to be taken down. Not really anything else changed there, apart from if you take an icon, you can. Um, you're going to be able to summon. Which is, um, and the lash whip and bone sword has changed to two separate weapons. So you, your lash whip is effectively each time the bearer makes a melee attack against a unit, you can reroll the hit rolls. But of course, if you combine it with the bone sword which is a cold bone so they're plus in one minus two and two damage again all right against space marines not really much all right against anything that's going to have that minus one hand flamers galore as usual in here rending claws is no longer a thing so you've got to remember you've got to be aware of this rending claws used to be a, a minus of one and if you roll the six it was a straight minus four so you could actually get through with some armor now what it is, is that it's cult claws and knife. So if you've got cult claws and knife, it's each time the bear fights, it makes one additional attack with this weapon. Basically meaning that you're gonna be getting three attacks per unit, but it's now strength, whatever strength you are for, which is still remaining the same. If you twisted heal, it's gonna be strength five. Uh, minus two and one damage. So you're no longer gonna get those auto kills, but it's more throughout the board, you're no longer one hit kill, you're gonna get a minus two on pretty much everything across. The heavy stuff has changed, and actually the demolition charge has changed, I'll come to that in a moment. The rock cutter is now completely different, uh, no, it's not completely different, I do apologize, it's now a straight three damage and minus one to hit. Still still track one to hit, and it was always um, roll a d6 each time a vehicle other than a vehicle suffers damage from this model, if you roll higher than the remaining wounds characteristic, it's instantly slain. That's been removed, so it's just times two, uh, minus four, and straight three damage. A little bit saddening, because I did like, uh, quite like taking characters off and deleting characters with that particular weapon. Rock Drill is still times two, uh, it's gone up to minus four, and it's one damage. Each time an attack is made with this weapon, if it is scored, it's automatically wounds. And a modified wound roll of six, the target suffers two mortal wounds in addition to any normal damage. So they've taken away the drill aspect, which was pretty much 
you were guaranteed to get quite a few wounds off a tank if you took a couple of those bad boys. Whereas now it's going to be, oh, well, you need unmodified sixes. Um, or an unmodified hit roll six to be able to get those two mortal wounds. When you're considering that you're only going to get two attacks anyway, it's not going to be the greatest. Um, you're not going to have the greatest chance of doing something of that nature. Rock Saw has not changed at all. Always good. And, but your demolition charges have. Now, the demolition charges used to be... Um, they've now got Blast. I think they had Blast anyway. Strength 8 minus 3 and straight 2 damage. But I believe your models with demolition charge get 2. So if you just give me a second. Yeah. For every five models, two Acolyte Hybrids from the Auto Pistol and Cult Claws and Knife Replaced with one of the following. Two Demolition Chargers. You're no longer going, oh well, he's chucked it, and that's it, that's rubbish. You can actually throw it twice, and then if you combine it with the one that allows you a full six attacks with that weapon, it's not so bad. Um, especially if you can get a bit of a crossfire going on there, you can get a plus one to hit, making it freeze. That's always nice actually getting the plus one to hit and trying to make it freeze. It is a crossfire unit. Um, that one is as well. Bores aren't. I don't think any of them other ones. No. So that's your first sort of those two, the jackal and the hybrids are your first crossfire models. And I keep going on here. Near fight hybrids are cross for next troop choice. Near fight hybrids aren't really didn't really have much of a say in the uh, addition of a codex. As you can see from there, it is just a, a picture and half a page. So no real profile change. That pretty much remains the same. Auto guns are remaining the same. Auto pistols are, bolt pistols are. Colt shotgun has changed to a straight four, rather than it being half range and you can get an additional. Uh, they've got the same blasting charges, the strength five minus one, as you saw previously. And of course, they've listed all of the other weapons here. So, frag grenade launchers remaining the same, heavy stubbers remaining the same. The mining laser is keeping the updated profile. A heavy one, strength nine, minus three, and d6 damage. I would have liked to have seen that be a bit better. Um, not the greatest weapon, if I'm honest. Seismic cannon is, is actually improved. Um, it's more of a, I think the short wave has been increased to 24 inches. Uh, web, web pistols and webbers. Now these are a big change uh, for me. Uh, web pistols, uh, each time an attack is made with this weapon, do not make a hit roll instead of roll 1d6 and the, and, and the attack sequence. If the result is greater than the highest strength characteristic of the target model, it's a mortal wound. And a Weber can do this D3 times. So for me, that's a lot easier. It was kind of overly complicated to the point where I didn't even bother taking any. I might have to go back out and get some more models or some Webbers. Chainswords add an additional one to the attack. Power Maul is um, plus two, minus one. Uh, power Pick is plus two, minus two, and one damage. Again, only one damage from some of these power weapons is a little, uh, it's a little bit of a shame, but all that's how it goes. Cult icon in your command phase if your unit contains a model of a cult icon, summons a cult. Always a good thing, and it is for every 10 models. Any model can replace it with a cult shotgun. One model can uh, be carried um, a cult icon for every 10 models in this unit. Two neophyte hybrids can have their auto gun replaced with one of the following heavy stubborn mining laser and thingy, and two can be replaced with uh, an launch. Webbers. Of course, you can always pick one a different type of outfit for your sergeant. So, mm, pure strains. Now, these guys, these guys are nice. As you notice, there is no Brood Brother infantry squad. All of the Brood Brother stuff is gone. Really has, which is really irritating. Pure Strain Gene Stealers. They've got the same movement, but they've now gone up to a weapon skill of two. But again, they've got a ballistic skill of six. I'm not quite sure why. But they've gone up to a weapon skill of two. So they're hitting on twos. They've got uh, four attacks apiece on profile now rather than the standard um, three. And they've got a four up invulnerable save. They've still got the swift and deadly, um, but they, again, the rending clause has been removed to a straight minus three. 
which is, is a lot better. It's a lot easier to, uh, to know what you're doing with those guys. Now, if you can cast a few powers on these, you can get them up some good attacks. You can make them five attacks a piece. Um, if you've got Twisted Helix, like I'm going to have it, you're going to be able to have these guys at movement nine, strength five. It's tasty. Very tasty, but you can only longer have 20 of the damn things in one squad. It's between five and ten. I'll be honest, I'll probably be running these guys in squads of five if I'm taking uh, elite choices, simply because squads of five of these are going to be nice to nip forward and jump on terrain and hold, uh, jump on objectives and probably hold objectives as well. If I'm completely honest, there's not going to be a lot that's going to be able to shift them properly. Um, that might be a waste, but at the end of the day, in the end, the game of a game is to score those objectives, it's not essentially kill everything. You could be killed completely off the table, uh, but you'd still win the game. So sometimes making sure that you've got units on objectives is the best thing to do, and making sure those units don't get knocked off is another good thing. So a couple more nice uh, units coming along here. We've got some hybrid metamorphs. They've not really changed apart from the toughness going up. And what they've good done is games work or they're good good, they're good done. His Games Workshop has effectively put all of their metamorph mutations into one easy to handle line called metamorph mutations. LA weapon. Plus one to the strength, making them strength five, minus three, and one damage, which is a bit of a shame. Um, you've got um, putting your talons, you've got the metamorph claw, which I suppose you have different options, but if you're just going to be bringing them in to try and make it easier, why give everything else? Huge difference. Now, we do have a. Um, they've got. This is pretty cool, to be honest. This uh, Savage uh, Alagun. Mm, yeah, that one. Each so our model in this unit is destroyed by a melee attack if that model has not fought this phase. Do not remove it from play. The destroyer model can fight after the attacking model's units has finished making attacks. After doing so, uh, any other rules when it's destroyed is triggered. And the model is removed from play. So effectively, if that unit gets in there and somebody counters and smashes them, you're like, yep, that's fine, you smash me. I am gonna smash you back. I'm really gonna smash you back. And I'll probably find that hybrid metamorphs, you're gonna be running them in large squads, and they're gonna be popping up with a cult icon in there, and they're just gonna be charging the hell out of everything. That's actually really improved the unit for me. I have met them all, so definitely got better. I'm probably going to be finding myself buying some more Gene Cold packs so I can actually run and purchase and, and run some of those guys. The yeah, Adamants, everyone were mentioning these online. These guys have got a hell of a lot better because at one point the interaction couldn't decide what strength the word, couldn't decide what toughness the word, could not decide what, could not decide anything with these blooming guys. The points value went up and down more than a yo yo. It was insane. Now, the yeah, Adamants are. Uh, they're pretty much the same stat line as previous, except they're now top and spine. They've got three wounds apiece. That is a change. And they've also done the same thing as they did for the hybrid metamorphs there with their weapons, where they've just basically counted them as a... Uh, it's just a heavy power weapon. So you get a plus three, you get a minus three, and it's a straight three damage. So that's like everybody having power hammers. But you don't need power hammers, you've got these guys. Heavy improvised weapons has been kind of nerfed a little bit. I did quite like the heavy improvised weapons previously. Um, it was times two strength. It was minus one or two damage. You made two attack rolls, so you get back to your lead squad leader, you got six attack. Now it is uh, just plus one, so you're going to be talking strength six, minus one and two damage. You're probably better off just having it as a heavy, you know, just having it as a, a normal improvised weapon at plus three, minus two, and straight three damage. They are going to hurt. They're going to hurt big time. I'll be honest with you. Uh, although I do like the fact that excess damage can be allocated to other units. That's quite amazing. That's quite funny. Uh, because you could smash six Imperial Guardsmen. If you can get it done. Um, they've also got Bestial Vigor. Which each time an attack is allocated to a model in some unit. Oh look. Look at that lovely rule there. Subtract one from a damage characteristic to the minimum of one. Yeah. Still... Games Workshop making sure those damage two weapons have no effect on these units. Um, it's a nice change to see something actually gain um, nice, a bit, bit better benefits. Not quite sure how many points are going to be, 
We'll find out when we're playing games. I don't really like going through the points and arguments when these units come out because I find games where don't do enough play testing. And then what happens is it gets taken to a tournament or something and people go, ooh, maybe not. And then they fit after everyone's gone out and bought models, of course. Abonnant. Abonnant is now an elite's choice. Um, we're talking pretty similar stat line as previous. You know, we've got six wounds compared to five, still three attacks. Um, it's still got the familiar. Um, it does ignore wounds and five up, same as what it used to do before. But it, I think it, yeah, it still reduces the, uh, it still reduces the um, attacks coming into it as well. And its power sledgehammer is now times two, minus three, and a D3 plus three. So they've increased power sledgehammer's damage, but not done anything to the mining laser. That does make them I think I'm if Lost Cannons are going to get any better anytime soon because they always seem to make sure it goes to the ultimate weapon to start with and then they nerf the crap out of them as the game goes on. But no real changes there to be honest apart from becoming an elite choice. Ooh, more characters. Now, starting with a Nexus, uh, a lot of the stat lines for a lot of these units have not changed if I'm completely honest with you. But this... Um, Unit now has, um, you can select, basically his, his abilities have changed. It used to be all be about command points and stuff before the game starts, whereas now he's in the command phase, if the model's on the battlefield, select one enemy unit on the battlefield, and that unit gains a crossfire marker. That's pretty good, because it basically means that if you've got him on the tabletop in your command phase, you can write that unit there, and get a plus one to hit. Strategic coordination allows you to select a core unit on the battlefield, then select a character within six, uh, a Primus, a, ja Prim a Jackal Alpha, a Columbus. So it's only one of those models. Until we start the next command phase, that core unit is considered to be in range of their abilities, which is pretty cool, to be honest. Um, you're effectively throwing out ranges um, from certain units to other units, especially the Primus, maybe re-roll ones to hit um, and it's considered to be in range of the character models or their abilities so you could hopefully do that and then give them a re-roll one to wound as well. Right. Clam a bust. Now the Sclam Scrambler Array used to um, enemy reinforcements used to not be able to be set up um, and then of course you used to be able to cause mortal wounds against units. Now again it's still the same in your command phase of all you saw your scramble away array, so scramble, scramble away. The units still can't set up within 12. You've now got proclamation hailer. So for a unit that's a core unit within 12, each time a unit force an action it can shoot without falling uh, without failing. That's pretty good. And combat attrition is Combat attrition is automatically passed, so if you fail, I'll well, take you on and I'll leave one guy. You also get the voice of truce, which is in the morale phase. Select one enemy unit within 12. Uh, it's in your morale phase and roll 3d6 if the result is greater than any leadership characteristics. Select one of the following. Until the start of the next morale, um, morale phase, that unit cannot perform any actions. Pretty good. Or you can lose objective security. Again, pretty good. That natural unit has come into its own by doing that. These are some. Pretty sneaky tactics, which I will probably find myself maybe purchased because I've not got a lot of these characters mainly because they didn't really do much for me in the game. Whereas now, some of the new changes that he's making me think maybe I should purchase one. Locus again, your profile is not really changing. Um, it is a bodyguard unit and it has a five up and vulnerable save, which he still used to have before. Now, uh, you pick a character, and that's that character's a ward. Whereas this used to be, oh, one of the locusts, this is the one with three, so one of the locusts, and so the attack will push the world, if you do so, it's two up. Whereas now, it's uh, the model can't be targeted. Obviously, this is within three inches of its ward, enemy models cannot target that ward with range attacks. While this model is a viable target for melee attacks made by an enemy model, that model cannot be targeted. Uh, Target this model's ward with melee attacks. So effectively, you can pick as a proper bodyguard. You can pick a cult character and go, "Yeah, you're not hurting it until I'm dead," which is pretty cool, to be honest with you. I mean, if you wanted to try and take out that patriarch, it's like, nope, it's 
So I'm not in that Magus. Nope, I'm not in until this guy is dead. Um, you should be able to perform heroic intervention now. You're looking, yeah. It's not going to perform a heroic intervention. Yeah, so you can still actually do heroic interventions. But start the fight phase and model an engagement range of enemy units. You can strike first. That's pretty much the same. So it's mainly the bodyguard bit that has changed. The locus, everything else, um, is pretty much remaining the same apart from the blades now cause two damage. The Kalamorph, everybody's favourite model. I really do like this myself. Uh, start line again. He always got up one attack actually. But his Liberator Auto stubs have lost a bit, gained a bit. They're now 18 inch ranges from 12. They've got strength of 5 instead of a strength of 4. They have lost a damage. But they do cause a mortal wound and a modified wound roll of a 6, which is pretty good. Gunslinger is very different. Uh, this model can target characters even if they're not close. This is the old rules. And uh, each time this model hits an enemy with a pistol, it can immediately make one additional hit roll against that target using the same weapon. These bonus hits cannot generate themselves further. Gunslinger each time a model makes a range attack, if a hit is scored after this model makes the rest of the range attacks, this model can make one additional range attack against the same target using the same weapon. So you can get up to nine hits if you're successful enough. Uh, you've also got your heroic deeds, which Kills enemy models with its ranged weapons and units with uh, reroll um, hit rolls of one. Well, that's what it used to be. Now it's still the same, but it's core units, and of course it has a five up vulnerable save, which is good because he's going to be getting in there. Um, the fact that he's got pistol does mean that you're not going to be able to run forward and uh, do an advanced roll to be able to get him in there. And he's not very good in close combat, but 18 inches basically means that someone's going to have to really be determined to try and come towards him. And also, he's going to be able to take out characters left, right and centre if he so wishes. Sanctus is pretty much remains unchanged, apart from, of course, you've now got Colt Sniper Rifle, so both him and the Jack can actually have that Sniper Rifle from the back of the book. And your Bio Dagger is pretty much same but you've got four attacks without bio dagger rather than oh, sorry five attacks without one rather than one like mega switch doesn't really do much um you know got used to have a perfect uh, ambush strategy which used to cost a zero with this model this is not the same now um basically this model gets a five up invulnerable save subtract one to hit each time a model made it to attack, that attack, can, or, uh, that attack automatically hits the target. The target does not receive the benefits of cover from that attack. That could be really good when you're combining it with the Santa's Pyro Rifle. Mm. It's also a clocked assassin. Enemy models cannot target this model with range attacks unless they are within 12 inch. And um, it counts as adding one to any arm save and throw for the benefit of cover, which is a bit better than adding two to your save like it used to be. And if he's equipped with a sniper rifle, he gains crossfire. Um, the attack speed has also been exposed to the attacks. We get no saves. So Sanctus models, I can see being, because these have gone up in a power rating as well. I can actually see these guys actually being used. Games are actually probably not shifting them. Now you've got a Reductus Saboteur. This is the one that's coming in the set. I'm not fan of it it's got some demolition charges it's got some explosives clandestine but workshop showing you all the rules for this and anyway so if you want to check that out just go on website and now we've got some biophagus um these are i've never really used these a lot if i'm honest with you um the weapons kind of come down a little bit used to cut injector god used to do uh mortal wounds whereas it doesn't now um, unless of course it's down here, it might do. I'll be down that in a moment. Stat line is pretty much the same as it used to be. Um, you've got the familiar that once per battle you can start to perform a twisted experimentation action. It's like one friendly core unit, so I don't unit within 18 inch of this model. It does not have a genome enhancement instead of one within three inches, so it's like the alchemist to forward to do that. That is pretty cool. Um, but it's whether or not. The model can be equipped, so you've got to give me additional points to be able to do such a thing. 
so you can do your twisted experiment action, which basically means that you pick a unit within three inches, you perform this action, it has to be completed at the end of your shooting phase, provided the unit is selected is still within three inches of the barrel. A Vegas um, model performing the action, if the action is successfully completed, the unit can select gains one um, genomic enhancement from the list before. If unit is adamant, you can select which otherwise will so if it's an adamant unit you can select if it's not you've got to roll d3 um so you've got a chance of it used to be plus one strength the sound model makes a melee attack improves the animal penetration characteristic by one that's not changed for resilience each sound model makes a melee attack and a modified oh no uh, resilience is each sound model with losing wounds on fire which is not lost uh, resilience we used to be plus one toughness and aggression Still the same aggression that used to be with three, uh, plus this is a scores one additional attack for each unmodified hit roll is ticked. That to me um, makes the barrel figures a lot better as well. That really does. It has it had to be within one inch at the end of the movement phase of the D61. There's no slaying now either, um, so there's no real downside of taking it. That's pretty good. That's actually quite a, an interesting unit, to be honest with you. Uh, the injector gold, after it makes its attack, select like one enemy unit, it's not lost any wounds, uh, but was not destroyed as a result of the attack. But well, these six is in great. So the, <laughs> the, the, shit, the snips ability uh, seems to have been given to him from the uh, previous unit, which is nice. You've got your jackals. Everyone likes the jackals. Everyone seems to take quite a few of these guys when they can. Um, you've got no real stat line change. I would like to have seen, apart from attacks, increased attack characteristics on these guys. You've got two attacks apiece now rather than uh, one, which is nice. Um, the incinerator is not increased in range and it's not really changed in its stat line at all. Uh, we've got the small arms, so this is, they're not allowing you to have or pistol or shotguns or anything of that nature separately it's all together in a <clears throat> small arms so it's just a pistol two strength four one um, which is a bit of a shame i suppose it does stop you from having a strength three pistol and a strength three shotgun at the moment six inches but I, I like to have a bit of variety sometimes i don't like to have it as a generic thing grenade launchers remain the same heavy stubbers remain the same mining lasers the same as previous now, you can actually have these uh, Athelon power weapons, which is uh, plus one to your strength, minus two to the armor save, and plus um, just a straight roll of damage. You used to be able to take a power pick. But when you read the information regarding these, is that anybody can actually have these now. Not just one person, anybody can actually have these power weapons, which is pretty cool. You can also have demo charges, and I think anybody, any number, oh no, can only be equipped with, uh, the leader of any can be equipped with a demo charge. Why wouldn't you, I suppose, you've got to have a strength. But again, if you're playing that grenade and you can get within that six inch, why not? Sure, I mean, 14 inch move, it's still pretty cool. You've not got the automatic uh, addition of the um, six inches like a lot of the other bikers do, but still got a minus one to hit. Um, you're allowed to shoot and charge on the turn that you fall back, so we're giving them some extra rules here. Um, your counter's being exposed, the target counts as being exposed if it's within six inch, so it's going to be ignoring um, cover saves, that's pretty good. Scout at the start of the first battle round before the first turn begins, if your unit's not been set up an ambush, it can make a normal move within nine, so you can pretty much run up the battlefield with these guys. So we've got quite a few of these units, which I know some people have. Get them in there. You've got the Ridge Runners. Ridge Runners, I don't think have changed much. Oh, the toughness has gone up to six. That's not really going to change much in what's actually going to be happening. The leadership has gone up to eight. Um, the missile launcher has changed because it used to just be a standard missile launcher, which is a bit of a shame because I quite like the standard missile launcher. I'm not really keen on this. Every three strength six. It's minus three and it's three damage, but it's a strength six. In a lot of vehicles, you're going to be needing fives to wound. <coughs> so you're not really going to, you're not really actually exchanging a lot on that one. You can have the mining lasers, the heavy ones, which of course is uh, a stat line that's not changed at all, but it does have blast. 
and your heavy mortars are going up in one strength. Yeah, again, they can target a unit that's not visible. Flare launcher. Uh, what was the flare launcher here? It would miss. It meant that if you lost a wound on a six, you didn't lose a wound. And you can select one friendly back unit within six inches, but model not model most an additional six inches of advanced space, not dice roll necessary. That's been removed, which is a bit of a shame. I've got enemy units do uh, need to minus two if you've got flare launcher added. We actually have a spotter, which adds 12 inches of range characteristics of the weapons the bearer has, so you can change some of those. That would be really good, actually. That would mean it would be um, 60 inches for your uh, heavy mortars. So if you've got a unit that you want this type of unit you want to stick it, well, you don't really want to stick this type of unit in the back. You don't want it to move them around. They've got scouts, so we can actually do the nine inch move the same as what the jackals can do. I'm not quite sure why you'd be keeping these in the back, but we've got no real survivability if they do start getting shot up. They still have the survey uh, Alga, which of course is going to be missed. It means that enemy units within 24 do not receive the benefits of the against them. Before it just used to be any unit that uh, benefit, but game board's smaller now, so. Now we're coming to the pitiful, and I mean pitiful, heavy support section of the book. Heavy weapon teams are no longer a thing um, because, of course, they've been removed. So, same with Colt Lim and Russes, they've gone as well. Um, the Goliath Rock Grinders, uh, I don't know if they've improved or not, if I'm honest. They have got faster, they've got faster than they were previously. Um, the ballistic skill stays the same. Now of attacks remains the same and they've still got 10 moves and a toughness of 7. The save has gone up to a 3 up rather than it being a, a 4 up, which I think is nice because of course a lot of weapons, heavy weapons especially, tend to have a minus 3. So when you're targeting vehicles, especially if it's a last cannon, you tend to be able to get a save against it with certain weapons. It's still got the cache of demo charges, which is it's always nice if you've actually got somebody back and back upon it. Again, that's an assault weapon, so it's assault D6. The clearance incinerator is still 2d6, but of course it's gone up to a heavy six. Heavy mining laser has not really changed. Heavy seismic cannon, I believe, has. I think this is a weapon that actually I have on my vehicle. Long wave and short wave are both now the same range. They used to be two separates. It's still talking heavy six and heavy three, and it's still, but it's now strength six minus two and two damage, and strength eight minus three and three damage. A lot better weapon than what it used to be. But you drill those blade. Oh. Oh, dual doors blade. It just gets two additional attacks, whereas it used to get a D3. And I'll be honest with you, every time I played with a damn thing, I always used to get additional. I used to get an additional three, so you get nine attacks with these things. It did used to be a strength of uh, nine, and it was minus two and D3 damage, whereas it's now minus two damage again. Two damage. And you've got rugged construction, which basically means that you minus in one to the damage characteristics. So enemy units, enemy you drill, drill those blades are not really going to affect you. And last unit of the game. And there's no tectonic frag drill in this at all. Um, so they've removed that completely, which is a bit of a shame for quite a lot of players. If you've actually purchased one of them, now it's just a terrain piece. Uh, your Goliath truck is again, you've uh, got the same stats, but it's got a little bit faster when it starts taking oh, only an inch. Um, still got the same cache of demo charges, apologies for the yawn there, and then we've still got the same twin auto cannon. It's still open topped, it's still rugged construction, of course, it's got crossfire and it still carries the same amount of people. That really not changed at all, the Goliath truck there. Not changed one bit. But of course, there's no Chimera, which is a bit of a shame. Now, industrial weapons, these are the ones that you, um, you actually get bonuses for for certain. I'm going to go through, just quickly through that, I'm not going to go through everything else, but I'll quickly go through your industrial weapon section. Might be able to see that the light might be taking that away. Um, but you're talking your incinerators, your artillery power weapons, your blasting charges, which is nice because that's your grenades, demo charges, your clearance incinerators, your uh, demolition, 
demolition charge. Hmm. Drill those a blade, your mining lasers, your power cut, uh, power weapons, your rock cutters, your rock drills, your rock swords, your seismic cannons, your mining lasers, your picks, your power sledgehammers, and your seismic cannons all count as industrial weapons. That'd be pretty cool, especially if you decide you're going to overcharge them in the melee and you get a plus one to your strength, although I'm not quite sure with certain units. Like, I mean, why would you do that for adherence? Depending, of course, upon who you fight, and you're just going to be smashing them anyway. Uh, oh. That is it. You've got your references at the back, and of course, you've got your points cost. No real point in me going through that because, of course, there's no real point. Um, simply because they're probably going to change it. I can see them definitely changing the points cost on them pure strains, especially if uh, we start using them. Why well, I think we're going to be using them, and they're still 14 points a model, and they're still quite expensive, but. Uh, toughness of four and then of course if you're taking twisted helix as an example you've got to move a nine you've got a strength of five and you're ignoring wounds on ones and twos so anything that strength eight is is no longer wounding on twos against them so your power fists that's when it comes into it you've got certain close combats that can and you're going to be able to stop dead in its tracks well thank you very much for watching there that was a bit of a long one it always is when i do something like this um but that is it that is the gene seal coat codex in a nutshell um i've kind of gone through everything and what i think it's going to be in comparing it to the previous codex it's probably quite a dry subject so if it was i do apologize but you'll probably get enough information there i may go through and think to myself what is good and what's not good what type of tactics you're probably going to have to deploy but that's probably going to be once the codex is out uh, keep an eye out for those that like the crusade section um i'm probably going to be doing a video regarding that separately because of course uh, a lot of people i find people now are either they're either match play or they're narrative play and they don't really cross over much nowadays which is a bit of a shame um but i mean i'm more of a, a narrative player than i am a match play player well thank you very much for watching guys if you did enjoy the content, please like, share, subscribe, hit that notification button to see more. And uh, don't forget, we try and get battle reports out when we can. And we also try and get a lot of uh, painting videos done. I'm saying that. Mm, it's a massive pile of shame. But thank you very much for watching. We'll see you next time.